Super glue? What? what is that, super glue? Super glue! <laughs> what? 
going crazy upstairs with that bell ringing all the time. Oh, dear June, will you get that? What did you say, Richard? One's from New York and one from San Francisco. There was something from Alaska early this morning. Good morning, Dr. Bradley. Good morning, good morning. Well, here we are, very bright, 
Mr. Whiteside. I hope that you are better. Thank you. I'm suing you for $150,000. How's that? What? I said, I am suing you for $150,000. You mean because you fell on our stairs, Mr. Whiteside? Samuel J. Leibowitz will explain it to you in court. Who are those two harpies standing over there like the kiss of death? You see, my cast was showing! Made from your own foot, I have no doubt. And now, Miss Stanley, I have a few small matters to take up with you. Since this corner druggist at my elbow tells me I shall be confined to this moldy mortuary for at least another ten days due entirely to your stupidity and negligence, I shall have to carry on my activities as best I can. I shall require the exclusive use of this room as well as that drafty sewer which you call the library. I want no one to come in or out while I am in this room. What do you mean, sir? We have to use the stairs to get to our bedroom. Isn't there a back entrance? Why, yes. Then use that. I shall also require a room for my secretary, Miss Cutler. Now, let me see. Ah, yes. I will have a great many incoming and outgoing phone calls, so please do not use the phone. I sleep until noon and must have quiet through the house until that hour. There will be five before lunch today. Where is the cook? Mr. Whiteside, if I may interrupt for a moment. You may not. Will you take your clammy hands off of my chair? You have the touch of a sex-starved cobra. And now, if all of you will please leave quietly, or must I ask my secretary to pass among you with a baseball bat? Well, we'll see you, Dandy. We'll call. Uh, we must have called. Uh, goodbye. Now, see here, Mr. Whiteside. There is nothing more to discuss, sir, considering the damage I have suffered at your hands. I am asking very little. Good day. I'll call you from the office later, Daisy. Not on this phone, please. Here is the menu for lunch. But I've already ordered lunch. It will be sent upstairs to you on a tray. I am using the dining room for my luncheon guests. Now, where are my cigarettes? Why, my son went for them. I don't know where he's gone. He's so... Here, Sarah. Here's the menu for lunch. I'll have mine upstairs on a tray. Young lady, I cannot stand indecision. Will you either go up those stairs or come down them? <laughs> oh, good morning, Mr. Whiteside. Here are your cigarettes. I'm sorry I took so long. I had to go to three different stores. You were gone long enough to have a baby. Is there a man who suffers as I do from the gross inadequacies of the human race? Where are you going? Will you go into the library and read the life of Florence Nightingale and learn just how unfitted you are for your chosen profession? Well, I think I can safely leave you in Miss Cutler's capable hands. Shall I look in again this afternoon? If you do, I shall spit right in your eye. What a sense of humor you writers have. <laughs> By the way, it really isn't worth mentioning, but I doing a little writing myself about my medical experiences. Oh, am I to be spared nothing? Would it be too much to ask you to glance it over while you're here? Trapped? Well, I just happen to have a copy right with me. Tales of a Humble Practitioner or 40 Years an Ohio Doctor. I shall, uh, drop everything. Thank you, and I hope you like it. Well, see you on the morrow. Keep that hip quiet and don't forget those little bills. Goodbye. <laughs> oh, Maggie, will you take uh, 40 years below the navel or whatever it's called? Well, I must say, you have certainly behaved with all your custom grace and charm. Now, look here, puss. I am in no mood to discuss my behavior, good or bad. I had no desire to cross this cheerless threshold. I was hounded and badgered into it. Now, after two weeks of racking pain, I find myself accused of behaving without charm. Well, what would you have me do? Kiss them? Very well. I should have known better than to do anything about your manners. But when I finally retire from 
this job. I may write a book about it all. Through the years with Prince Charming. Listen, Repulsive. You are tied to me with an umbilical cord made of piano wire. And now, if we may dismiss the subject of my charm, for which, incidentally, I receive $1,500 per personal appearance, possibly we can get down to work. Ah, no, we can't. Yes! My name is Harry Stanley. I know that you're Sherry Whiteside. I found this holly, framed green against the pine trees. I remember what you had written about Ken and Jude the Obscure. It was the night. What's that? That was Mr. Stanley's sister, Harry. I talked to her a few times. She's quite strange. Strange? She's right out of the Hound of the Baskervilles. But you know, uh, I have seen that face somewhere before. Nonsense. You couldn't have. Oh, well. Let's get down to work, shall we? Here, uh, press this in the doctor's book. Oh. I see no reason why I should endorse maiden form braziers. Here's some telegrams. What date are these? December 10th. Send a wire to Columbia Broadcasting. You can schedule my Christmas Eve broadcast from the New York studio as I shall return east instead of proceeding to Hollywood. Stop. We'll have as my guests for the special New Year's Eve broadcast Irving Berlin, Astaire and Rogers, Catherine Hepburn, and uh, Churchill on short way from England. Whiteside. Are you sure you'll, sure you'll be all right by Christmas, Sherry? Of course I will. Now, uh, send a cable to Mahatma Gandhi, Bombay, India. Dear Boo Boo, <laughs> schedule changed. Can you meet me, Calcutta, July 12th, dinner at 8.30, Whiteside. Ah, uh, let's see. A wire to the editor of the Atlantic Monthly. Dear Stinky, do not worry. Copy will arrive. Whiteside. Now, a wire to Arturo Toscanini. Where is he? I'll find him. Counting on you January 4th for my annual benefit for the Home for Paroled Convicts. As you know, this is a very worthy cause and dear to my heart. Uh, can you have quiet dinner with me and Ethel Barrymore afterwards? Whiteside. If that's for Mrs. Stanley, tell them she's too drunk to talk. Hello? What? Hollywood? If it's Goldwyn, hang up. Oh, hello, Banjo. Banjo, give me that phone. Banjo, you old so-and-so. How are you, darling? Come on, give me the phone. Shut up, Sherry. Are you coming east, Banjo? I miss you. Oh, he's going to live. Oh, stop dribbling and give me the phone. In fact, he's screaming at me right now. Here he is. How are you, you fawns behind? And what are you giving me for Christmas this year? <laughs> How are you, Banjo? How's the picture coming? Good, good, wonderful. How are Wacko and Slavo? Fine. No, no, I'm all right. Yes, I have the best horse doctor in town. But what about you? Are you having any fun? Good. Are you playing any cribbage? What's that? Well, don't take all of his money. Leave some for me. Well, Banjo, I can't waste my time talking to Hollywood riffraff. Yes, that's right. Well, kiss you Ella Parsons for me, will you? Goodbye. He took $1,400 from Sam Goldwyn at Cribbage last night. Sam said to him, Banjo, I shall never play garbage with you again. <laughs> what do you want now, Miss Bedpan? It's your pill. One every 45 minutes. Ah, now, where were we? Here's a cable from that dear friend of yours, Lorraine Sheldon. Ah, let me see. Mm -hmm. 
Sharon, my poor sweet lamb, have been in Scotland in a shooting party with Lord and Lady Cunard, and only just recently heard of your poor sweet hip. And down in Surrey with Lord Bottomley, sailing Wednesday on the Normandy, and can hardly wait to see my poor sweet Sherry, your blossom girl, Lorraine. In the words of the master, I may vomit. Now listen, Puss, we mustn't be bitter because Lorraine is more beautiful than you are. Lorraine Shelton is a very fair example of that small but vicious circle you move in. Pure sex jealousy, if I ever saw it. Now, let's have the rest of those, hmm? Lorraine Sheldon, Lord Bottomley, my Aunt Fanny. <laughs> ah, this one is from Destiny's Tot. Oh, England's little rover boy? Yes. Dear Baby's Breath. What's this I hear about some hip fractured in a bordello brawl? Does this mean our annual Christmas party is off? Just finished the play in Pago Pago and it's superb. Myself and the ukulele leave Honolulu tomorrow in that order. By the way, the Sultan of Zanzibar wants to meet Ginger Rogers. Let's face it, Beverly. He does travel a lot, doesn't he? You know, it would be nice if the world went around change. Yes, it's Hollywood next week. Say, why couldn't he stop over here on his way to New York? Send him a cable. Beverly Carlton, uh, Royal Hawaiian Hotel, Honolulu. If these people intend to have their friends using the front door... What do you want them to do? Use a rope ladder? I will not have a lot of mildewed pus bags rushing in and out of this house while I am here. Good morning, Mr. Jefferson. John. Go away! There's no one home! The Stanleys have been arrested for white slavery! Good morning, Mr. Whiteside. I'm Jefferson of the Massalia Journal. Get rid of him. I'm sorry. Mr. Whiteside is seeing no one. Really? So will you please excuse us? Good day. Mr. Whiteside seems to be sitting up and taking notice. I'm afraid he is not taking notice of the Massalia Journal. Do you mind? You know, if I'm going to be insulted, by Mr. Whiteside himself. I never did like carbon copies. Ooh, touche if I ever heard one. And in Massalia, too, Maggie, dear. Will you please leave? How about an interview, Mr. Whiteside? I never give them. Go away. Mr. Whiteside, if I don't get this interview, I lose my job. Well, that would be quite all right with me. Now, you don't mean that, Mr. Whiteside. You used to be a newspaper man yourself. You know what editors are like. Well, mine's the toughest one that ever lived. You won't get around me that way. If you don't like him, get off of the paper. Yes, but I happen to think it's a good paper. William Allen White could have got out of Emporia, but he didn't. You have the effrontery in my presence to compare yourself with William Allen White? Only in the sense that White stayed in Emporia. And I want to stay here and say what I want to say. Such as what? Well, I can't put it into words, Mr. Whiteside. Uh, it'd sound like an awful lot of hooey. But the journal was my father's paper. It's kind of a sentimental point with me, the paper. And, well, I'd like to carry on where he left off. Aha, uh -huh. so you own the paper, eh? That's right. Then this terrifying editor, this dread journalistic apocalypse, is you, yourself. In a word, yes. I see. In the future, Sherry, let me know when you don't want to talk to people. I'll usher them right in. Young man, come over here. I suppose you have written the great American novel. No, I've written the great American play. Ah, uh, well, I don't want to read it. Uh, ah, do these old eyes see a box of goodies back there? Would you hand them to me, please? The trouble is, Mr. Whiteside, that your being in this town comes under the heading of news. Practically the biggest news since the Depression. So I just got to get a story. Ah. Pecan butternut fudge. Oh, my. You mustn't eat candy, Mr. Whiteside. It's very bad 
for you. My great aunt Jennifer ate a box of candy every day of her life. She lived to be 102, and when she was dead for three days, she looked better than you do now. <laughs> now, you were saying, old boy, you were about to say something. At least I can report to my readers that uh, chivalry is not yet dead. We, uh, we won't discuss it. Well, now that you have won me with your pretty ways, what would you like to know? Well, uh, how about a brief report on famous murders? You're an authority on murder as a fine art. My dear boy, when I talk about murder, I get paid for it. I have made more money off of the Snyder Gray case than the lawyers did, so don't expect to get it for nothing. Well then, uh, what do you think of Vesalia? How long are you going to be here? Where are you going? Things like that. Very well. A. Vesalia is a town of irresistible charm. B. I cannot wait to get out of it. C. From here I go to Crockfield for my semi-annual visit to the Crockfield home for paroled convicts, for which over the past five years I have raised one half million dollars. Have uh, you ever been to Crockfield, Jefferson? No, I haven't. I always meant to. As a newspaper man, you ought to go instead of wasting your time here with me. It is only about 75 miles from here. This aging debutante, Mr. Jefferson, I retain in my employ only because she is the sole support of her two-headed brother. Ah, uh, <clears throat> I understand. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Whiteside. Uh, you've been very kind. By the way, I'm a cribbage player if you need one while you're here. Fine. How much can you afford to lose? I usually win. We won't discuss it. Come back around 8.30. We'll uh, play three-handed with Lizzie Borden here. <laughs> Shut in! of Professor Adolf Mitz, the world's greatest authority on insect life. How do you do? How do you do? How do you do? <laughs> well, Shani, oh, Mitz, stop looking at me adoringly and tell me why you are here. You are sick, Shani, so I come to cheer you. Jefferson, this man spent two years in a cave with nothing but plant lice. He rates three pages in the Encyclopedia Britannica. Don't you, my little hookworm. Please, Shady, you embarrass me. Look. <laughs> I brought you a present to validate the hours. I said to my students, boys and girls, I wish to give a present to my sick friend, Shady Tinbaitza. So you know that D made for you, D made for you, a community of Periplaneta Americana. Commonly known as the American Cockroach. Behold, Sherry, Roach City. Inside here are 10,000 cockroaches. 10,000? Oh, Sarah will never believe this. And in one big Sherry, if all goes well, there'll be 50,000. If all goes well? What can go wrong? They're in there, aren't they? Quiet, please. You can watch them, Sherry, but they live out their whole lives. There's the maternity hospital. Isn't it fascinating? They do everything that human beings do. Well. Please, Maggie. These are my cockroaches. Sorry. Go ahead, Mets. With these earphones, Shady, you can listen to their mating calls. There's tiny microphones down inside. Listen. Well, how long has this been going on? <laughs> Any Planeta Americana. There are cockroaches in this house. I beg your pardon. <coughs> Mr. Whiteside, I do not know who this man is, but I will not stand here. Then go upstairs. <laughs> uh, these are probably my luncheon guests. Mets, you are staying for the day, of course. Certainly. Jefferson, stay for lunch. Glad to. Maggie, tell them there will be two more. Ah, Baker, gentlemen. Jefferson, these men, now serving the final month.
months of their prison terms, have chosen to enter the ivy-covered walls of Crockfield Home for paroled convicts. They have come here today to learn from me a little of its tradition. Gentlemen, I envy you your great adventure. Say, you're Michelson, aren't you? The butcher shop murderer. Yeah. Yes. I thought I recognized you. Ah, the last fellow, Jefferson, is Henderson, the hatchet fiend. He always shot them up in a salad bowl, remember? <laughs> oh, yes. Lunch is ready, Mr. Whiteside. Good, gentlemen, let's go right in. Can I help you? Oh, thank you, Jefferson. We're having chicken livers, tetrazzini, and cherries jubilee for dessert. I hope every tummy is a flutter with gastric juices. John, make sure this door is closed. I don't want anyone crying on their betters. It was in one of my most treasured memories, 
This curious legend that I am a difficult person is pure fabrication. Ah, ice skating, eh? Ah, me, I used to cut the figure eights myself, arm in arm with Betsy Ross and the flag waiting behind us. Oh, it was wonderful on the ice today. Miss Cutler, Mr. Jefferson were there. Maggie, ice skating? Yes, she's good too. I got a great picture of her right here. Was she still there when you left? I think so. Yes, they were. <laughs> Mr. Whiteside, why people have a picture of you? I'd love to have one. Very well. Would you like my profile? I'm afraid you've done for Mr. Whiteside. My brother is a camera for you. Thank you, Mr. Whiteside. I got a great one. Oh, hello, Miss Cutler. Hello there. Good evening, Sherry. Really, Sherry, you've got this place looking like an old parrot cage. Did you not have a cat? Sherry Burford has played me this afternoon. It's superb. It isn't just a play written by a newspaper man. It's superb. Will you read it tonight, Sherry? It just cries out for Hepburn. Will you send it to her, Sherry? And will you read it tonight? No, I will not read it tonight or any other time, for that matter. And while we're on the subject of Mr. Jefferson, you might ask him if he wouldn't mind paying your salary since he takes up all of your time. Oh, come now, Sherry. It isn't as bad as that. Really? I have not even been able to reach you not knowing which hay loss you frequent. Oh, stop behaving like a spoiled child, Sherry. Don't take that patronizing tone with me, you flea-bitten Cleopatra. I am sick and tired of you behaving like some lovesick high school girl sneaking out every time my back is turned. Well, Sherry, I'm afraid you've hit the nail on the head. Oh, stop acting like Gracie Allen and explain yourself. I'll make it quick, Sherry. I'm in love. Nonsense. This is merely delayed puberty. No, I'm afraid you're going to be losing a very excellent secretary. You are out of your mind. Yes, I think I am a little. But I'm a girl who's waited a long time for this to happen. And now it has. Mr. Jefferson doesn't know it yet, but I'm going to do my darndest to marry him. Is that all? Yes. Except that this is what might be called my resignation. As soon as you've got someone else. Now, now look here, Maggie. You are indispensable to me, but I think that I am unselfish enough not to let that stand in the way where your happiness is concerned, because, well, whether you know it or not, I have a very deep affection for you. I know that, Sherry. That being the case, I will not stand around and allow you to make a fool of yourself. I'm not. Sherry. But you are, my dear, you are. You're behaving like some Booth Tarkington heroine. It is completely unbelievable. I cannot believe that a girl who for the past 10 years has had the great of the world served up on a platter before her, I cannot believe that it is anything but temporary insanity when she is swept off of her feet in seven days by a second-rate small-town newspaper man. Sherry, I can't explain what's happened. I can only tell you that it's so. Here I am, a hard-bitten old cynic, behaving like true story magazine and liking it. Discovering the moon and ice skating. I keep laughing to myself all the time, Sherry, but what can I do about it? I'm in love. We're leaving tomorrow. Hip or no hip, we leave here tomorrow. I don't care if I fracture the other one. Now, get me a train schedule and start packing. I'll get you out of this, Miss Stardust. I'll pull the ants from those moonlit pants. It's no good, Sherry. It's no good. I can back in the next three-line train. My dear, it is simply unbelievable. Can you see yourself, the wife of the editor of the Massalia Journal, having an evening at home for Mr. and Mrs. Stanley, Mr. and Mrs. Poopface, and the members of the Book of the Month Club? Sherry, we've had 10 years of the great figures of our time, and don't think that I'm not grateful to you for them. They've been wonderful years, Sherry. Oh, no, Bert 
luxury, he's gentle, and he's unassuming. And well, I love him, that's all. I see. Well, I remain completely unconvinced. You are drugging yourself into this Joan Crawford fantasy, and before you become completely anesthetized, I shall do everything in my power to bring you to your senses. Now you listen to me, white dog. and my lecture bureau were to learn that I am well, they would insist on my fulfilling my contracts. Therefore, we must not tell anyone, not anyone at all, that I am well. I see, I see. Not even Miss Cutler. No, I won't. Not a soul. Not even my wife. That's fine, doctor. Mr. Whiteside, when do we start work? Tonight? I've just got that one patient that's dying, and then I'll be perfectly free. Um, uh, tomorrow morning, Doctor. Will you excuse me? This is a private call. Yes. Yes, this is Whiteside. Thank you. Tomorrow morning, Doctor. Tomorrow morning it is. Good night. Good night. Yes, 
Mrs. Whiteside, put them through, please. I'll be so proud to work with you, Mr. Whiteside. You've made me very proud. Yes, of course, Doctor. Very proud. Bye. Good, Good night. Hello, yes. Lorraine. Lorraine, my blossom girl. How are you? Yes, I'm all right. Yes, I am still out here. Now, listen, my dear. When do you land in New York? Tuesday. Well, that's fine. Now, listen closely, my pet. I have a wonderful bit of news for you. Yes, I have discovered a wonderful play with an enchanting part in it for you. Hepburn would give her eye teeth to play it, but um, I think I can get it for you. Now, wait, wait, let me explain. The author is a young newspaper man here in town. That's right. All it takes is a little doing, and you are just the girl that can do it. No, 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 he's young and attractive and just your dish, my dear. Yes, that's right. Just jump on a train and arrive. Lorraine, don't send me any messages. Just get on a train and arrive. Yes, that's right. Oh, there is no need to thank me, Lorraine. Yes. Well, have a nice trip, and we'll see you soon. Goodbye. Good evening, Miss Prynne. My, you look absolutely radiant. Before. I'm afraid I was a little unjust. That's all right, Maggie. We all lose our tempers from time to time. I'm supposed to have dinner with Bert and then go to a movie. But we'll come back and play cribbage with you instead. Oh, that's fine. See you soon, Cherry, dear. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, I was just a little rabbit in the sunshine. Well, John, you see, Christmas is Mr. Whiteside's personal property. He invented it, and it's his. First thing tomorrow morning, Mr. Whiteside will open each and every present, and there will be the goddamnest fuss you've ever saw. My, look who he's got presents from. Shirley Temple, Errol Flynn, and Frank Sinatra, and John Steinbeck. I can hardly read for two quarters. They can hardly get dressed at night. Good evening, John. Good evening, Mr. Jefferson. Merry Christmas. Hello, Maggie. Merry Christmas, Sarah. Merry Christmas, Mr. Jefferson. Say, business is good, isn't it? My, what a little quiet blackmail and a weekly radio hour can get you. What did his sponsors give him? They gave him a full year supply of their own product. Cream of mush. <laughs> well, he'll give it right back to them over the air. Clean. Under the influence of God knows what, I've just bought you a Christmas present. Why, Mr. Jefferson, sir? Only I'd like you to see it before I throw away my hard-earned money. Can you run downtown with me and take a look at it? This is very sweet of you, Bert. What is it? I can't wait. A two-year subscription to Time Life Look and Listen. Say, do you think I'm going to tell you? Come down and see. All right. for Christmas. 
Christmas, Mr. Jefferson? I have enriched your feeble life beyond your capacity to repay me. Yes, that's what I figured. So I'm not giving you anything. I see. Well, I was giving you my old trust, but now I shan't. What time did you say the radio men were coming, Maggie? About 6.30. I'll be here. You've got to cut, Sherry. You're four minutes over. Oh, by the way, there's a wire here from Beverly Carlton. He doesn't know what train he can get at Chicago, but he should be here sometime this evening. Good. Is he staying overnight? No, he's got to get right out again. He's sailing Friday on the Queen Mary. Think I could peek in at the window and get a look at him? Beverly Carlton used to be one of my heroes. Used to be, you ink-stained hack. Beverly Carlton is the greatest single talent in the English theater today. Take this illiterate numbskull out of my sight, Maggie, and don't bring him back. Yes, Mr. Whiteside, sir. I won't come back until Beverly Carlton gets here. Where are we going, Bert? I want to know what you've bought me. I'm like a ten-year-old kid. <laughs> you know, you look like a ten-year-old kid right now, Maggie. It's that. Yes, give me the mansion house, please. Hello, mansion house. Yes, has a Miss Lorraine Sheldon arrived yet? Yes, that's right, Miss Lorraine Sheldon from New York. She hasn't, eh? All right, thank you. Exercises. Oh. But Mr. Whiteside, it, it's been a week now. Oh. My book, you know. When are we going to start work on my book? Shh. I was hoping that today. Oh. Maybe. Good evening, Miss Prince. Good evening, Dr. Bradley. Oh. Mr. Whiteside, we'll just have to get. Dr. Bradley, perhaps I'm not well, but oh, when I opened the door just now, I thought I saw a penguin with a thermometer in his mouth. What's this? <laughs> the penguins, yes. And Miss Green, will you go in and uh, go in and entertain them, will you, until I come in? Uh, yes, sir. Ah! The Christmas tree in the bedroom just fell on Mr. Stanley's head. He's, <laughs> he's got quite a big bump, actually. Well, isn't that just too bad? Go on, Miss Green. Hello, Mr. Whiteside. Uh, hello, Dickie, my boy. Well, Mr. Whiteside, will you have some time later? I don't know, Doctor. I am 
terribly busy. Well, suppose I wait a little while. I'll, I'll wait a little while. <laughs> Dr. Bradley is the greatest living argument for mercy killing. <laughs> now, Dickie, what would you like this evening? A candid camera shot of my right nostril? No, thank you, Mr. Whiteside. I'm all stocked up on those. But have you got some time to look at some new ones I've taken? I certainly have. Why, these are splendid, Richard. There's a real artistry in them. Well, they're as good as anything by Margaret Bourke White. These are the essence of photographic journalism. Say, I didn't know they were as good as that. I just like to take pictures, that's all. Richard, I have been meaning to talk to you about this. You're not just a kid fooling around with a camera anymore. These are good. This is what you ought to do. You ought to get out of here and do some of the things you were telling me about. Uh, just get on a boat and get off wherever it stops. Galveston, Mexico, Singapore. Take pictures. Millions of them. Terrible pictures, wonderful pictures, everything. Say, wouldn't I like to, though? It's what I've been dreaming of for years. If I could do that, I'd be the happiest guy in the world. Well, why can't you do it? If I were your age, I'd be off like a shot. Well, you know why, Dad. Richard, do you really want to do this more than anything else in the world? I certainly do. Then do it! Hello, Dick. Good afternoon, Mr. Whiteside. Ah, hello, June, my lamb. Ah, Richard, I am afraid it is up to you. I guess it is. Thank you, Mr. Whiteside. You've been swell, and I'll never forget it. right -o, Richard. June, are you coming upstairs? Uh, in a few minutes, Richard. Knock on my door, will you? I have to speak to you. Yes, I will. Mr. White. June, my lamb, you were too young to know about the Elwell murder, weren't you? Completely fascinating. I have about five favorite murder cases, and the Elwell case is one of them. Would you like to hear about it? Well, Mr. Whiteside, I want to talk to you for a few minutes. Would you mind? It's kind of important. Certainly, my dear. I take it this is all about your young Lothario out at the factory. Yeah. I can't seem to make Father understand. It's like talking to a blank wall. He won't meet him. He won't even talk about it. What are we going to do, Mr. Whiteside? Sandy and I love each other. We don't know where else to turn. My dear, I would like to meet this young man. I'd like to see him for myself. Would you, Mr. Whiteside? He's, he's in the kitchen now. I'll bring him in. Good. Bring him right in. Mr. Whiteside, he's... He's a very sensitive boy. You will be nice to him, won't you? God damn it, June! When will you learn that I am always kind and courteous? Now bring this idiot in! Nancy! Nancy! Here he is, Mr. Whiteside. This is Sandy. How do you do, sir? How do you do, young man? I've heard an awful lot about you this past week from June. It would seem to me, if I have been correctly informed, that you two babes in the woods have quietly gone out of your minds. There's another name for it. It's called love. You have come to the right place. Dr. Sheridan Whiteside, broken hearts, mended, breaks, we line, hamburgers, etc. Will you have a seat, please? Well, if June has told you anything at all, Mr. Whiteside, you know the jam we're in. You see, I work for the Labor Union, Mr. Whiteside. I'm an organizer. And lately, I've been organizing the men down at Mr. Stanley's factory. And, well, he's pretty sore about it. I'll bet. Did June tell you that? Yes, she did. Well, that being the case, I don't think I have the right to try to influence June. If she marries me, it means a definite break of the family. And I don't like to bring that about. But the trouble is, Mr. Stanley's so stubborn about it, so arbitrary. You know, it's not something I've done just despite him. We fell in love with each other. And Mr. Stanley behaves as though we're all a big plot, as if John L. Lewis sent me here just to marry his daughter. If only he'd let me talk to him. If he'd let Sandy talk to him. Well, we've gone over all that, June. Besides, this morning I've got word of meeting in Chicago, and I may have to go out to Frisco from there. So you see the jam we're in. Sandy's leaving tonight, Mr. Whiteside. My dear, this is absurdly simple. June, I like your young man. I have an unerring instinct about people. I have never been wrong. That is why I wanted to meet him. My feeling is that you two will be very happy together. Whatever his beliefs are, he's entitled to them. And you shouldn't let that stand in the way where your happiness is concerned. As I see it, it is no problem at all. But. 
stripped of its externals, what does it come down to? Your father and the possibility of making him unhappy. Is that right? Very unhappy. Well, that isn't the point. So what if he's unhappy? It's good for him. Develops his character. Look at me. I left home at the age of four and haven't been back since. He hears me on the radio and it's quite enough for him. Then your advice is to go ahead, Mr. Whiteside? It is. Marry him tonight, June. You mean that, Mr. Whiteside? No, I mean you should marry Harpo Marx. Of course I mean it. What would you like me to do? Say it all over again? My own opinion is that you're not good enough for this young man. Come on, Daisy. Stop fumbling. Forgive us for trespassing, Mr. Whiteside. Oh, not at all, old fellow. Not at all. It's Christmas, you know. Merry Christmas. Yes, yes. Merry Christmas. June, would you like to come along with us? We're taking some presents to the Dexter. No, no, thank you, Mother. I have some letters to write. Come on, Daisy. Why, Mr. Stanley, what happened to your forehead? Did you have an accident? No, Mr. Whiteside. I'm taking boxing lessons. Go ahead, Daisy. <laughs> Stanley, a, a Christmas gift for me? Oh, it's only a trifle, but I wanted you to have it. It's a picture of me, as I used to be. It was taken on another Christmas Eve many years ago. Oh. oh! Don't open it until the stroke of midnight. Okay? <gasps> Merry Christmas, Miss Stanley, and thank you. Merry Christmas! Oh. This is the Stanley residence, isn't it? Yes, it is. I've come to see Mr. Whiteside. We've come to be jealous this year. Lorraine! Lorraine, my blossom girl! Sherry, my sweet! Oh, darling, look at that poor, sweet, tortured face. Oh, let me kiss it. Nice entrance. Now relax. Hmm? But Sherry, darling, I've been so worried. Oh, and now seeing you in that chair. My dear, this chair fits my fanny as nothing else ever has. I feel fine. My only concern is news of the outside world. So take off that skunk and tell me everything. Darling, I'm so relieved. Oh, you look perfectly wonderful. I never saw you look better. My dear, do I? Oh, I just dashed through New York, but didn't do a thing about Christmas. Well, I had my hair done and got right on the train. Oh, and of course, London before was so magnificent, my dear. Well, I simply never got to bed at all. And darling, I've so much to tell you, and I don't know where to start. Well, start with the dirt first, my dear. What about you? How about your love life? I don't believe for a moment that you never got to bed at all, if you'll pardon the expression. Sherry, dear, you're dreadful. Come now, what about that splendid bit of English mutton? Lord Bottomley, haven't you hooked him yet? Sherry, please. Cedric is a very dear friend of mine. Please, Lorraine, don't try to pull the bedclothes over my eyes. Don't tell me you wouldn't like to be Lady Bottomley with a hundred thousand pounds a year and twelve by the way, has he had those teeth fixed yet? Every time I order Roquefort cheese, I think of those teeth. Sherry, really? Cedric may not be bright. Oh, but he is rather sweet, poor lad. Oh, and he's very fond of me. And he does represent a kind of English way of living that I like. Oh, Surrey and London for the season. Shooting box in Scotland. Oh, that lovely old castle and well. Sherry, I think from something he said just before I sailed, that he's finally coming around to it. Oh, it was a definite 
mind you, but uh, don't be surprised if I am Lady Bottomley before very long. Lady Bottomley? Well, won't Kansas City be surprised? Ah, me. I shall be a bridesmaid and give the groom an iron toothpick as a wedding present. Now, let's have some more of your skullduggery. Well, I... Mr. Whiteside. Not now! Oh, uh, he's fixing the plumbing. <laughs> now, come ahead, dear. Some more news. But Chevy, what about this plan? After all, I've come all the way from New York. How is it on Christmas Eve? I've been so excited ever since your phone call. Oh, where is it? When can I read it? All right, here is the situation. The author, a young newspaper man here in town, gave me the play with the intention that I send it to Hepburn. Oh, it is a wonderful part, Lorraine, and God knows I do feel disloyal to Kate. Sherry! Anyway, there it is. Now, I have done this much. The rest is up to you. He's young and attractive and, well, just how you'll go about persuading him, I'm sure you know more about that than I do. Darling, how can I ever thank you? Uh, does he know I'm coming, Mr. Jefferson, I mean? No, no, dear. You're just out here visiting me. You'll meet him and, well, get him to take you to dinner. Work around to the play and... Good God, Lorraine. Do I have to tell you how to do these things? How did you get all those other parts? Sorry. Well, I'll go back to the hotel and get into something more attractive. Oh, I just dumped my bags and rushed right over here. Oh, darling, you're wonderful. Yes, run out and put on some working clothes, Lorraine. <laughs> back and spend Christmas Eve with Sherry, I'll have Jefferson on tap for you. By the way, who do you think is paying me a flying visit this evening? None other than your old friend, Beverly Carlton. Really? Beverly? I thought you would be glamorous again on a tramp steamer. Oh, come now, dear. We mustn't be bitter because he got better notices than you did. Don't be silly, Sherry. I never read notices. I simply again, that's all. Oh, he's not staying here, is he? I hope not. Temper, temper, my dear, he's not. Say, that is a splendid bracelet. This is a new bit of loot, isn't it? Haven't you seen this before? Cedric gave it to me for his mother's birthday. She was simply furious. And look, darling, I've got a taxi outside. If I'm going to get back here, I really... Sherry, <laughs> look, I just give it the most Oh, you, my dear. Santa has been at work, my pet. Blossom Girl just dropped in out of the blue and uh, surprised us. Hello, Lorraine. And who is that? Is that Bert? Come down here, Bert. Lorraine, this is Mr. Bert Jefferson. He's a young newspaper man here in town. Bert, Miss Lorraine Sheldon. How do you do? How do you do? I didn't quite catch the name. Jefferson? That's right, pet. <laughs> Why, Mr. Jefferson, you don't look like a newspaper man. Oh, you don't look like a newspaper man at all. Really? I thought it was written all over me in neon lights. Uh, no, not at all. Oh, I should have said you were, oh, I don't know, perhaps an aviator or an explorer or something. They have that same kind of dash about them. <laughs> Uh, Lorraine, if you want to hear Mr. Jefferson's life story, you'll have to do it on your own time. Maggie and I have a lot of work to do. Now, out, Jefferson. On your way, Blossom. On your way. He is the world's rudest man, isn't he? Oh, can I drop you, Mr. Jefferson? I'm going down to the mansion house, I think it's called. Thank you, but I've got my car. Suppose I drop you. Oh, would you? That'd be lovely. And we'll send I'll see you in a little while, Jerry. Bye, Maggie. Goodbye, Maggie. I'm invited back for dinner, am I not? Oh, yes, of course. I always feed the needy at Christmas time. <laughs> now, stop oozing out. Get out! Come on, Mr. Jefferson. I want to hear more about the Oh, and I want to know a good deal about you, too. Maggie, did you say there was a car?
copy of the broadcast here. How much time did they want out? Four minutes? That's right. Four minutes. She's looking very well, isn't she? What's that? Who? The Countess the Pushover. <laughs> Quite a surprise, her dropping in, isn't it? <laughs> yes, yes it is, Maggie. Come, let's get down to work, shall we? Why? At this joyous time Isn't of year. Curious? There was Lorraine, snug as a bug in somebody's bed on the Normandy. There, the Yuletide. Now, Sherry, we will talk to Now, listen, Maggie. Just because a friend of mine happens to drop in at Christmas time doesn't. Ah, that must be Beverly. Will you run and see if it is? Go ahead, run along. My pie. A large, moist, incestuous kiss for my magpie. Come in here, you Piccadilly pen pusher, and gaze upon a soul in agony. <laughs> Don't tell me how you are, Sherry dear. I want none of the tiresome details. I have only a little time, so the conversation shall be entirely about me. And I shall love it. Shall I tell you how I glitter in the South Seas like a silver scimitar? Would you rather hear how I frolicked through Zambesia, raping the Major General's daughter, and finishing a three-act play at the same time? Magpie, dear, you are the moonflower of my middle age, and I love you very much. Say something tender to me. Beverly, darling. That's my girl. Now then, Sherry, dear, without going into mountainous waves of self-pity, how are you? I'm fine, you presumptuous cockney. Now. How was your trip? Wonderful? Fantastic. I did a fabulous amount of work. By the way, did I glimpse that little boudoir butterfly, La Sheldon, in a motor car as I came up the driveway? You did indeed. She's paying us a Christmas visit. Ah, dear girl. They do say she set fire to her mother. Oh, but I don't believe it. <laughs> Now, Sherry, my evil one, not only have I written the finest comedy since Moliere, but also the best review since my last one. <laughs> and an operetta that is so good, it frightens me. I shall play for eight weeks in London, six in New York, and that is all. No matinees. Then, I'm off to the Grecian Islands. Why don't you come along, Magpie? Why don't you desert this cannonball of fluff and come with me? Beverly, dear, be careful. You're catching me at a very good moment. Now, Beverly, how was Hollywood? How long were you there? Three unbelievable days. I saw everyone from Astaire to Zana. How about Banjo? Did you see my wonderful Banjo in Hollywood? Uh, I did indeed. He gave a dinner for me. I arrived in white tie and tails to be met by two bewigged butlers who proceeded to take my trousers off. <laughs> I was then ushered in my lemon silk drawers into a room full of Claudette Colbert, Norma Shearer, and Aldous Huxley, among others. Dear, sweet, incomparable Banjo. I wish Banjo were here now. What's the matter, Magpie? Is Lorraine being her old sweet, sick-making self again? You wouldn't take her to the Grecian Islands with you, would you, Beverly? Just for me? Now listen here. Lorraine is a charming person who has gallantly given up her own Christmas to spend it with me. Ah, uh, I knew I had a bit of dirt for us all to nibble on. Mr. Whiteside. Not now. <laughs> Have you uh, kidnapped someone, Sherry? Yes, that was uh, Robert Louis Stevenson. Now, come ahead. Is this something juicy? Juicy as a pomegranate. There's the latest report from London on the winter maneuvers of Miss Lorraine Sheldon against the left flank, all flanks in fact, of Lord Cedric Bottom. Listen, Lorraine has just left us in a cloud of Chanel number five. Since September, in her relentless pursuit of his lordship, she has paused only to change girdles and to check her oil. She has chased him, panting, from castle to castle until he finally took refuge for all several weekends in the gentleman's laboratory of the House of Lords. She is sailing tomorrow on the Normandy, but would return by the Atlantic Clipper if bodily so much as belches in her direction. 
Have you ever met Lord Bottomley Magpie? No, I haven't. <clears throat> no, very good shooting today, Blasted. Only four partridges, six crowns, and the Duke of Sutherland. Ho, ho, ho. My God, that is Bottomley to his very Why must you race right out of here? I never see enough of you, you ungrateful moppet. I can only tell you, Sherry, dear, that my love for you is so great that I'd change trains in Chicago just to come here and spend ten minutes with you and wish you a Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, my lad. My magpie. Beverly! Damn it, Maggie, will you get rid of them, please? Until Mr. Excuse me. <laughs> Who is that man? Never mind. Beverly, I'm in great trouble. What's the matter, Magpie? I fall in love. No. Yes. For the first time, Beverly, I fall in love. I can't tell you about it now. There isn't time. But Sherry is trying to break it up. And in, and in his own fiendish way, he's going to do everything he can to break it up. Why the old flounder? What's he doing? Lorraine. He's brought Lorraine here to smash everything up. You mean it's someone here in this town? Yes, the newspaper man you're going to meet at the station. And he's written a news, he's written a play. And I know he must be using that as bait. You know, Lorraine, she'll eat him alive. You've got to help me, Beverly. You've got to get Lorraine out of here. The further away, the better. But how can I? I'm leaving. Have you come from the broadcast, Miss Cutler? Yes, there's one on that table. Thank you. What are those penguins ate the original? Why, I love it. I absolutely love it. It's simply enchanting and bitches Sherry and Lorraine at the same time. I adore it and I shall do it up around. The first baby will be named Beverly. You're wonderful. Of course I am. Count the Chiswick on your honeymoon and I shall put you up. Well, goodbye, Magpie. Goodbye, Sherry dear. Mercy, let me get out of here. No, John, this isn't television, thank God. You only hear the leap of voice. Mr. Whiteside's really wonderful, isn't he? The things he finds time to do. Yes, he certainly sticks his nose into everything, John. Miss Cutler, is the flyer out there yet? Yes, they are, Miss Whiteside. Thank you. Why, Miss June, are you going away? Why, no, John, no. Miss Whiteside. Oh, yes, he's getting ready to go on the radio. Oh, would you... No, never mind. Where is he? In the library? Oh, well, maybe we ought to wait till in the kitchen. Joy to be Stephanie. 
interesting people. That's quite a gown, Lorraine. Going anywhere? This till I just threw on anything at all. Aren't you dressing for dinner? No, just what meets the eye. Who does your hair, Maggie? A little French woman named Maggie Cutler comes in every morning. You know, every time I see you, I keep thinking your hair could be so lovely. I've always wanted to get my hands on it. And I've always
understand this, Lorraine, am I to gather from your girlish squeals that you are about to toss your entire career into the ash can? Sherry, you couldn't expect... Oh, don't explain, Lorraine. I understand only too well. I also understand why Hepburn remains the first lady of our theater. Oh, this is wonderful. We're in luck, Lorraine. There's a plane leaving Cleveland at 10 3. Why, it all works out perfectly, doesn't it, Sherry? Peachy! Maggie, what's the number of the hotel in that? Oh, I've simply got to get my name stopped and practice. Beside it, three, two. making 
the damnedest spaces for about five minutes. Uh, yes. Mr. Jefferson, go ahead. Make me a Jefferson special. In fact, make it a double. My headache has gone with the wind. Okay. Sherlock Holmes is now at work. H Hello, operator. Yes. Could you tell me if there was a call placed to this phone within the past, oh, half hour? Yes, I'll wait. Terry, what is all this? Shh. Yes? There have been no calls to this phone from England within the past three days? Hold a moment, please, Lorraine. Now repeat that. Operator, dear. Oh, and have a Merry Christmas. Sherry, what is all this? Oh, what does this mean? It means, my dear, that that was Beverly Carlton you poured your girlish heart out to, not Lord Bottomley. <laughs> ah, me. Who would have thought five minutes ago you were not going to London? Sherry, I want this explained. Explained? Well, you heard the operator, my dear. Tell you is that Beverly Carlton was indulging in one of his famous bits of mimicry. You've heard him do Lord Bottomley before, haven't you? Yes, of course. But why would he want to do such a thing? Oh, this is one of the most dreadful. <gasps> oh my god! Oh my god, that cable! <laughs> Tonight, we'll go back to the hotel and you'll read me your play. Why, 
Why, I should say so. I'd be delighted. Maggie, did you hear that? Say, I'll bet you did this. You arranged the whole thing. Well, it's the finest Christmas present you could have given me. Oh. Maggie. Everybody, cream of mush brings you Sheridan Whiteside. This is Whiteside speaking. On this eve of ease, when my own heart is overflowing with peace and kindness, I think it only fitting to tell once again the story of that calm and lustrous night, nigh unto two Billy's 
tavern all night. Never realized it was daylight until it was <gasps> daylight. <laughs> Listen, Maggie, Miss Sheldon says the play needs just a little bit of fixing. Do it in three weeks. She's going to take me to a little place she's got in Lake Placid just for three weeks. Going to work on the play together. Isn't that wonderful? Why don't you say something, Maggie? Look, Bert, I suggest you tell oh, about this. Excuse me. Uh, Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. God bless us all and tidy Tim. Yes. <laughs> for three weeks. Isn't that wonderful? Ever hear of Lorraine Shelton, the famous actress? Well, she's taking me to Lake Placid for three weeks. Dr. Bradley, I think <laughs> Mr. Jefferson would like some black coffee and a little breakfast. Would you take care of him, please? Yes, yes, of course. Dr. Bradley, I'm going to buy a breakfast for you. Biggest breakfast you ever had. Yes, yes, Jefferson. You know what, Doc? doesn't believe in Santa Claus. We should climb down some chimneys. We should climb down his chimney and frighten the hell out of him. <laughs> now look here, Maggie. I am willing to forgive your tawdry outburst and talk about this calmly. Miss Stanley. I'm afraid I shouldn't be seen talking to you. My brother would be terribly angry. I just couldn't resist asking. Did you like my Christmas present? I am terribly sorry, Miss Stanley. I haven't opened it yet. I haven't opened any of my Christmas presents yet. Oh, dear. And I was so anxious. Miss Stanley, I appreciate your thinking of me. Why, Miss Stanley, this is lovely. I'm very fond of these old photographs. Thank you very much. I was 22 when that was taken. That was my favorite dress. <gasps> do you really like it? I do indeed. When I get back to town, I shall send you a little gift. Would you? Oh, Mr. Whiteside, I would treasure it forever. <gasps> oh. <gasps> well, I must be going. I would be late for church. <gasps> goodbye. <gasps> oh, goodbye. Goodbye, Miss Stanley. Oh, <gasps> oh. <laughs> what is it about that woman? Sarah's got a little surprise for you, Mr. Whiteside. She's just taking it out of the oven. Oh, thank you, John. some rye bread. Away from me, you reform school fugitive. How did you 
get out here anyway? Santa alone means reindeer. Whiteside, we finished shooting the picture yesterday, and I'm on my way to Nova Scotia. Flew here in 12 hours. Barred an airplane from Howard Hughes. Whiteside, I brought you a wonderful little Christmas present. This brassiere was once more. I'm on my way to Nova Scotia. Where's Maggie? Nova Scotia? What are you going to Nova Scotia for? I'm sick of Hollywood. There's a dame in New York they don't want to see. So I figured I'd go to Nova Scotia and get some smoked salmon. <laughs> Where the hell's Maggie? I want to see her. What's the matter with you? Where is she? Banjo, I am very glad you're here. I'm very annoyed at Maggie. Very. What is this? I thought you couldn't walk. Oh, I've been all right for weeks. That isn't the point. Banjo, I am furious at Maggie. She's turned on me like a viper. You know how fond I am of her. Well, after all these years, she's repaying my affection by behaving like a fishwife. What are you talking about? But I never believe...